what is the optimum way to monitor women with suspected sepsis in the puerperium. Monitoring of the women with suspected severe sepsis or established sepsis should be multidisciplinary but preferably under the leadership of a single consultant. A senior obstetrician should be involved in consultation with an intensivist, microbiologist, or infectious disease clinician. Regular observations of all vital signs, including temperature, pulse rate, blood pressure, and respiratory rate, should be recorded on a modified Early Obstetric Warning Score or MEOWS chart. What infectious disease history or information should be noted? Any recent illness or exposure to illness in close contacts, particularly streptococcal infections, should be noted. A history of recent sore throat or prolonged household contact with family members with known streptococcal infections, pharyngitis, impetigo and cellulitis, has been implicated in cases of Group A streptococcal sepsis. Intravenous drug misuse carries a higher risk of staphylococcal and streptococcal sepsis, as well as generalized immunosuppression of chronic disease, endocarditis, and blood-borne viruses. Recent febrile illnesses, especially if associated with chills and rigors, suggest bacteremia. Gastrointestinal symptoms such as diarrhea and vomiting may be attributable to foodborne pathogens, Clostridium difficile infection, or early toxic shock. Ingestion of unpasteurized milk products raises the possibility of infection with Salmonella, Campylobacter, or Listeria. Chlamydophila cetaci is acquired by contact with aborting ship or infected birds or by cross-infection from washing contaminated clothing. Q fever is caused by coxilia burnetti after inhalation of infectious particles from birthing animals or contaminated dust. What investigations should be performed? Blood cultures are the key investigation and should be obtained prior to antibiotic administration. However, antibiotic treatment should be started without waiting for microbiology results. Routine blood tests should include full blood count, urea, electrolytes, and C-reactive protein or CRP. Serum lactate should be measured within 6 hours of the suspicion of severe sepsis to guide management. Serum lactate greater than or equal to 4 millimoles per liter is indicative of tissue hypoperfusion. Blood cultures and other samples taken should be guided by clinical suspicion of focus of infection such as throat swabs, midstream urine, high vaginal swab, throat swab, placental swabs, sputum, cerebrospinal fluid, epidural site swab, cesarean section or episiotomy site wound swabs, and express breast milk, and should ideally be obtained prior to starting antibiotic therapy as the results may become uninformative within a few hours of commencing antibiotics. If diarrhea is particularly offensive following antimicrobial therapy, a stool sample should be submitted for Clostridium difficile toxin testing. A history of diarrhea warrants routine culture, for example, salmonella, and Campylobacter. Any relevant imaging studies should be performed promptly in an attempt to confirm the source of infection. This could include a chest x-ray, pelvic ultrasound scan, or computed tomography scan if pelvic abscess is suspected. If the methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus status of the woman is unknown, a pre-moistened nose swab may be sent for rapid MRSA screening where such testing is available. Any women with symptoms of tonsillitis or pharyngitis should have a throat swab sent for culture. Appendix number 2. Diagnostic criteria for sepsis modified from Levy et al. using Center for Maternal and Child Inquiries 
and Lewis were pregnancy-specific parameters available. How should sepsis in the puerperium be managed? The focus of infection should be sought and dealt with. This may be by uterine evacuation or by drainage of a breast, wound, or pelvic abscess. Broad spectrum antibiotics should be given to cover these procedures. Which antibiotics should be used? Administration of intravenous broad spectrum antibiotics within one hour of suspicion of severe sepsis, with or without septic shock, is recommended as part of the surviving sepsis resuscitation care bundle. If genital tract sepsis is suspected, prompt early treatment with a combination of high-dose broad-spectrum intravenous antibiotics may be life-saving. A combination of either piperazzeline and tasobactam or a carbepinim plus clindamycin provides one of the broadest ranges of treatment for severe sepsis. Methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus may be resistant to clindamycin, hence if the woman is or is highly likely to be MRSA positive, a glycopeptide such as vancomycin or tacoplanin may be added until sensitivity is known. Breastfeeding limits the use of some antimicrobials, hence the advice of a consultant microbiologist should be sought at an early stage. What are some of the adverse effects of treatment? Treatment with any antimicrobial can cause allergic reactions, including skin rashes. However, it should be remembered that, particularly in toxic shock, a maculopapular or blanching erythema may be exotoxin-related and not an allergy to the therapy. Diarrhea, particularly if offensive or developing after any antimicrobial therapy, should be sent for Clostidium difficile toxin testing. The organism does not infect neonates but can cause up to 30% mortality in mothers if untreated. What is the role of intravenous immunoglobulin or IVIG? Intravenous immunoglobulin is recommended for severe invasive streptococcal or staphylococcal infection if other therapies have failed. Intravenous immunoglobulin has an immunogelatory effect, and in staphylococcal and streptococcal sepsis, also neutralizes the superantigen effect of exotoxins and inhibits production of tumor necrosis factor and interleukins. The main contraindication to intravenous immunoglobulin use is a congenital deficiency of immunoglobulin A. Where should women with sepsis be cared for? Women with sepsis in the puerperium are best managed in a hospital where diagnostic services are easy to access and intensive care facilities are readily available. Early referral to hospital may be life-saving. How should a drug misusing woman be managed? Women with a history of substance misuse are usually monitored under multi-agency care. The local drugs advisory specialist team and existing hospital guidelines for care of substance misusers or drug users should be consulted. Any injection site lesions should be swabbed and an MRSA screen performed. Alternative access devices such as a central venous catheter or peripherally inserted central catheter, are more likely to be required for long-term intravenous antibiotic treatment and early referral of the woman to a vascular access team or equivalent is desirable. What are the infection control issues? The woman should be isolated in a single room with an N-suite facilities to reduce the risk of transmission of infection. Mothers or neonates infected or colonized with high-risk organisms such as Group A Streptococcus 
Methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus or Panton Valentin leucosidine producing Staphylococci may generate outbreaks within the healthcare setting, especially for other babies in nursery units and staff. The local infection control team should be informed of any such cases and appropriate isolation precautions followed. Healthcare workers defined as doctors, midwives, nurses, anesthetists, and members of the wound care team should wear personal protective equipment, including disposable gloves and aprons, when in contact with the women, equipment, and their immediate surroundings. Isolation in a single room with an N-suite facilities is recommended since numerous streptococcal outbreaks have occurred in maternity units, some involving shared toilet and shower facilities. Methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus and Group A streptococcus are easily transmitted via the hands of healthcare workers and via close contact in households. Local infection control guidelines should be followed for hospital-specific isolation and contact precautions. PVL-associated infections should be managed in accordance with national guidelines. Breaks in the skin of the woman or carer must be covered with a waterproof dressing. Fluid repellent surgical mask with visors must be used at operative debridement, change of dressings of Group A streptococcus necrotizing fasciitis, and for other procedures where droplet spread is possible. Visitors should be offered suitable information and relevant personal protective equipment while the woman is isolated. What are the neonatal issues if sepsis develops in the puriperium? The baby is especially at risk of streptococcal and staphylococcal infection during birth and during breastfeeding. The umbilical area should be examined and a pediatrician consulted in the event of sepsis in the puriperium. If either the mother or the baby is infected, with invasive Group A streptococcus in the postpartum period, both should be treated with antibiotics. What are the indications for prophylaxis to family and staff? Close household contacts should be warned about the symptoms of Group A streptococcus infection and told to seek medical attention should symptoms develop. Asymptomatic contacts may warrant prophylaxis. Local and national guidelines should be followed in consultation with the local health protection unit or consultant for communicable disease control. Can sepsis in the puriperium be prevented or detected earlier? All pregnant and recently delivered women should be informed of the signs and symptoms of genital tract infection and how to prevent its transmission. This includes avoiding contamination of the perineum by washing hands before and after using the lavatory or changing sanitary towels. It is especially necessary when the woman or her family or close contacts have a sore throat or upper respiratory tract infection. Any group A streptococcus identified during pregnancy should be treated aggressively. All clinical staff must undertake regular, written, documented, and audited training for the identification and initial management of serious obstetric conditions or emerging potential emergencies such as sepsis, which need to be distinguished from commonplace symptoms in pregnancy. Any signs of infection or necessity to administer antibiotics noted during a woman's hospital stay should be reported directly to her community carers which involve a general practitioner, midwives, and health visitors when she is discharged so that appropriate follow-up visits may be arranged and the significance of developing symptoms recognized. Appendix number 1. Staphylococcal and Streptococcal Toxic Shock Syndrome Clinical Disease Definition 